see each other as because we are real. Okay, does uh, <clears throat> everybody make it back on? Yes, yes sir. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yep. Yep. All righty. So one thing that you guys are going to notice about the uh, the with the way the the class works, and and now that now that everybody has kind of gotten to know each other. Um, is so the with this go to meeting platform um just in case you guys aren't familiar with how it works it, it'll always tell you who's talking like if you see the little control box that you use for the go to meeting at the very top it'll always tell you who's talking so if if uh you know anytime somebody has a question or um you know starts talking you can hear you know, it should always say you know whoever is talking up there at the top just in case you're wondering and you want to see that. Um, one thing too is is um, is anytime you guys are in the class, and and, it, and a lot of this does depend on like the microphone that's built into your laptops or your tablets or whatever you're using. But some microphones are a lot more sensitive than others, and some pick up a lot of background noise. So if you know that <clears throat> that you might be in an environment that has some background noise or or things like that. Um, remember to to try to keep yourself muted um, if you if you think that that might be a problem because sometimes um, just in the past and, and you'll kind of notice this because it'll it'll occasionally happen here or there. But um, the person who has the background noise doesn't doesn't usually necessarily know that there that there's noise and that other people are picking it up. And, uh, but sometimes it causes a lot of feedback into the other anybody else who's logged on. So just remember, in, unless you know that you're in an absolutely quiet, quiet place in your homes or wherever you're logging on from, just remember to, um, unless you have a question or whatever, just to, it's usually best to just remain muted um, unless it's, you know, like I said, unless you're being solicited to say something or, or if you have a question you want to get in and and chime in but for the most part <clears throat> for the most part you guys are free to talk and ask questions whenever you want and one thing that's really important about the uh, these online classes um, but you know these first several weeks that we you know most of this obviously is online but the the the, the thing that we really need everybody to remember is is that we we always desperately need a lot of participation from everybody in class. Um, it's so hard for us as the instructors to gauge how much you guys are learning and, 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 you know, what, you know, if, if somebody's struggling with, with a particular topic, because, you know, when you're in person and you're in class, it's really easy for the instructor to, to read people's faces and read body language and read, you know, you can, confusion is, is usually written all over people's faces when you're in person and in class. And, and so the, obviously the major handicap of having an online class like this is we don't, we don't have that opportunity to, to be able to gauge your body language and, and see if you kind of have a confused look on your face. So, Odds are, if if there's something that we're talking about that's that you're not understanding, odds are that there's other people in class that are in the exact same position. So never, never hesitate to chime in. Ask as many questions as you would like. Um, it's better to, to stop us in our tracks and have us go over something, repeat something, and and talk about something in more depth and more length if needed right when we're going over it rather than to have to like come back to it later on. So just remember that um, we really, really like participation. We like you guys to be able to talk and to chime in and make comments. Um, also, we're always open for suggestions. Um, anything that you guys feel that can always make this class run better. If there's something that um, you guys know of that we're not doing or just even any just suggestions in general. 
um, to, to make this class better and more conducive for you guys to learn. That's, that's something that we always want to hear. And we always are open to making those adjustments and, and whatever's needed to help you guys succeed. So our goal here is to get you guys all to your dispatch licenses. Um, you guys have all, you know, paid, you know, good money to be in the class. And we want you to get every, every ounce of your money's worth out of this and, and more. So um, this is, this is your guys's, really, this is your class. This is your guys's show in a way to, to be able to get in and, and make it everything that you guys want it to be. And, and honestly, what you need it to be. So just remember that going forward. Um, it, it seems like the dynamics of every class are, are pretty similar. There's always people that like to talk more than others. There's other people that, that are, don't like to talk so much. So, um, just remember, I mean, I know that that is always going to probably be something that we have, but just, just remember if you're someone that doesn't necessarily like to talk as much, just, just know, you know, we, we, we do, we do need a certain amount just to kind of know and to be able to gauge where you're at with things and, and to make sure that everything's okay with, with, uh, your grasping the knowledge and the concepts of everything that we're teaching. So, um, with that, um, let's chat for a minute about some of these, some of the programs and different links and sites that we use for the classes. Has everybody in here been able to log into the Google Classroom uh, site that we have for the class? I tried. I don't think it worked, though. Okay. Yeah, I, uh, I haven't been able to yet. Okay, because I, I got yes. in there and I saw, in fact, I'm looking at it right now. And I'm actually going to turn on my screen here so you guys can all. Yeah, I was wondering if there's something on TV or not. Okay, can everybody see my screen there now? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it looks like everybody, except for, it looks like Paul and, and Wes, look like maybe the ones on my side that maybe haven't been able to get into it. I think that it might, this is kind of regarding, I, I sent out an email um, about the, there might be, you may have to have or may have to create a Google account in order to get into this. This is actually the first time we've used this Google Classroom for this class. And so that's kind of why I'm bringing it up because I there's a lot of the ins and outs that I'm still trying to learn myself, but it's supposed to be a lot kind of a, a like a home room type environment to where we can host all of the different things that we're doing with this class kind of in one main area. So you're not constantly having to go to this site and that site, but everything's kind of centrally located here. And then you can kind of go from here to where, you know, as long as you're in the classroom, you can go from here to our YouTube channel page, to the Google Drive page, to um, the go to meeting links, anything like that should be centrally located here in the Google Classroom, as well as we can do assignments <coughs> and quizzes and different things like that from, from this central location as well. So we're kind of going through this Google Classroom thing for the first time on our side. So um, Wes, it looks like you already have Gmail, so all you should need to do is just log into it and accept your invitation into the classroom and Paul I know it shows you have Hotmail do you by chance have a, a any sort of a Google account at all Paul yeah I do okay you may just need to access it from that or if you want to send me whatever that Google account email address is I can resend the invitation straight to that and then I also I can still use your Hotmail address for like all of the correspondence for the class, um, but just for the purpose of just getting into the classroom, you may need to use the other one as all. Well. Okay. And just you guys, just let me know if there's any issues with that. But for those of you guys that have gotten into it, um, 
I'm not sure if you've had a chance to look around through it at all. Um, I, I did post links to the GoToMeeting, to the Google Drive, to the YouTube channel. Um, the, I posted the course outline in here. Did, has anybody been able to – did anybody see that stuff or – Anybody that wants to chime in, feel free. Yeah, it, yeah, I saw it in there. Okay. Adam, this is Tara. Uh, is that the one that we've been messaging on, or is that a different one? Yes, that is the one that we were messaging on, yeah. and We're good. Yeah, some of you guys that have been signed up for a while, um, I th you may have gotten this classroom invitation like a month ago, maybe six weeks ago. So I know like in your case, Tara – um brian as well um some of you guys may have seen the invitation quite a while ago um okay so just want to kind of show you guys around this when you guys log into this it should always come to this home page right here and when you log into the classroom it'll always show you know it'll say aircraft dispatch academy august 2018 class um, it'll list the instructors there along the bottom. Um, and then any announcements, anytime that we post an announcement or an assignment, all of you should get an automatic email to, you know, you'll automatically get an email. Those emails are going to come from Aircraft Dispatch Academy. They won't necessarily come from me. So like if, if all of the instructors have the capability of doing the announcements, assignments, and things like that. So if anything gets added in there, you'll always automatically get an email. If it's an assignment or a quiz, you'll get that email and it'll obviously tell you, you know, when it's due or, you know, any information surrounding the assignment or the quiz should be, should be uh, conjointly with that, you know, with the email or, or inside of the email as well. So, but it, you should always come to this homepage. Um, so you're going to see various things in there. Um, you can click on the students tab. It'll show you everybody that's in the class. Then you can also click on the about tab. And that's where you're going to see there's going to be a link in the top left hand co corner, the class drive folder. You can click on that and that'll take you right to the Google Drive to where all of our all of the all of the uh, information for the class is held on the class drive. Um, there's also down here, I, I posted some links. This, uh, there's a, a YouTube video here that I'm going to have you guys watch here in a few minutes. Um, there's the go to meeting link. So if you're ever, you know, lose the, uh, the link for the go to meeting, as long as you get into the classroom, you can actually just come into here and then click on this link. And then I put right there the password equals dispatch. So you can actually just access the go to meeting right there. You can access the YouTube channel at this link right here and just know so the, our youtube channel um it already has like 150 videos on the channel but most of those videos are from all the previous classes that we've held so you can obviously go in there and see videos now um of previous classes and you know feel free to watch whatever you guys want to watch but uh just know that a lot most everything that's in there now is from you know, the, we had a class in April, we had a class in January, we had, you know, our classes last year. All of those YouTube videos have been uploaded. And, you know, <clears throat> you can go back and later on, you know, once we get all of our, um, once we get several days behind us, every one of our classes that we do, all, all of our online classes, every one of these is recorded. Everything, even right now, I'm recording this as we speak, it's recording. And so at the end of every class, the instructor uploads the, the recording for that night up to our YouTube channel. And so you're going to like tonight or tomorrow morning, you're going to probably get an email that says, you know, week one, day one class video was uploaded. And that'll be the very first video that would show up to you guys under this link. So when you guys click on this, it takes you straight to the August 2018 class videos playlist, which is specific for your class. Um, 
when you go into that, you can obviously go to the other parts or to the other playlist. There's an April 2018 class playlist, January 2018 class playlist. So just know that those are the videos for those other classes. And you can watch those videos, like I said. Um, <clears throat> there's, it's always, you know, the more you watch, obviously the more the better. But uh, the big idea for the YouTube channel stuff is for, if you ever miss a class, like, you know, one of these online classes that we're going to have over the next six weeks, if you ever miss one of these, the very next morning, that material should be available for you to log in or, or to jump into our YouTube channel and for you to get on there and watch the class. So, um, and then anytime, even if you were present for the, for the live session, um, but you just want to get on there and review, you know, same idea. You can get in there and you can go back and you can watch the recording of the class and go over any parts of it that you want to review or study for, anything like that. But that's that's always available for you. And it's going to be a big asset for you going forward as well, especially in any studying and things like that. Um, then obviously um, there's the Google Drive link access there. That link here is going to be the same link as if you clicked on this top left hand drive class or class drive folder they go to the same place and we'll go into those a little bit later but does anybody have any questions on on the functionality of the school classroom stuff so far it's, it's pretty straightforward i think but does anybody have any questions I'll take the silence as no questions. So, yeah, well, that's that's fine. It's it's all good. Um, pretty simple. What's that? It's, it seems pretty simple, pretty straightforward. Yeah, it is. I think so. Uh, that's a good idea. There's also a classroom calendar, and you know, anything like that'll show you like due dates. Now, now, in this class, there's not necessarily much in the way of assignments, per se. Um, once we get to, like, the in-class portion, you'll have flight planning assignments, but we'll, we'll cross that bridge once we get to the in-class portion. But as far as the, the six weeks online, there's not much um, as far as actual, like, assignments to do outside of class. Occasionally, you'll, you'll get assigned to do, like, a worksheet or something like that. But you'll do part of that in class, and then you know one of the instructors might ask you to work on it a little bit outside of class if you have time as well. That might be an exception to where you might see an outside of class assignment. But generally speaking, there's not going to be much. Um, it's pretty much just all, you know, getting on during the four hours that uh, class is actually running is going to be the majority of your learning. Um, <clears throat> Um, now on this on this YouTube thing, it on the last course you guys did is that all on YouTube too? Yeah. Obviously you said I, I know you said that, but so do you teach the same thing every course? It's the same. It's it's generally the same topics. Um, it, well, the the course itself is what we teach in this class is actually regulated and mandated by the FAA. So. Um, all of the course material is is specific to what the FAA has us teach you. So yeah, so technically every class does cover the same topics. It's the, the, the biggest difference is just being the dynamics of each class, when we cover them, you know, and, and how we cover them. And, you know, each class we do modify things a little bit to sometimes we spend more time in a certain area as compared to different areas. And, and that just varies with every class. But but yeah, the classes technically, as far as the curriculum goes, they're identical. So you can skip. You can obviously skip ahead and just watch the YouTube on the next next topic we're going to teach, and just try to get prepared for that. As in, you know, what I mean. Potentially, yeah. In, in some cases, now now we do sometimes change the the schedule around. So, like for instance, we made some pretty major schedule changes. Um, on this year's classes on like when we teach stuff. So 
the days n may not always align perfectly for what for what you would be expecting to see based on the course outline. Like the course outline for the last class might be different than this one. It's the same material, but sometimes we move it around because we're always fine tuning like, you know, like this subject might be better paired with a different subject that's on a different week and day. And sometimes we move stuff. So um, that yeah. might be something you might run into. But generally speaking, yeah, it follows the it follows what you would expect to see. Mm. That's cool. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, yeah, if you're. I would doubt in most cases, I'm going to probably doubt that most of you will, will ever really want to jump ahead because you're going to be pretty inundated with information in this class that you probably won't feel like you want to or even can jump ahead. But uh, but yeah, I mean, like I said, feel free to watch any of the other videos from any of the other classes. Um, mm. it's, uh, and hopefully, if nothing else, you'll at least be able to see how much more we've improved over the years. <laughs> Yeah. <clears throat> so cool. So um, if you click on the, um, I'm not sure if any of you guys are just following along with me, but if you're in here, you click on the class drive folder. That's actually going to take you right into our Google Drive. And in here, you are going to see there's there's already some stuff in here. There's different tabs. Um, you'll get you'll see that there is there's a tab for like course manuals and if you go into there you can see like a course manual. You can see that the aircraft that we use in this class is the CRJ 700. You can click on that. And you can see. Um, performance manuals, weight and balance manuals. A lot of this stuff we're actually going to get into later in the class. But uh, a lot of the stuff is already in there. Uh, flight planning section, you can see, you know, once we get into that, there's a lot of the manuals in there. Our, our navigation charts and stuff are already in there. Um, if you click on the tab that says lesson plans right here, right now you'll see that it's blank, but as class goes on, that you're going to see that there's going to be a folder for every week of class. So right now you just see week one. So if you if you go into it, it doesn't have anything in here. But normally when you go into this, it's going to say day one, day two, day three, day four, day five. Okay. And so those are all going to be underneath week one. And then days one through five should each have their own folder. And in each of those folders, there's going to be either the information or, or whatever, whatever information we covered that day is going to be in that folder. So it, it's always pretty well organized for you. You can see when you click on week one, it actually tells you August 6th through the 10th. And then week two is going to be August 13th through the 18th or whatever. So you, you'll know like what day, you know, if, if, you're, if, if it's a day that you're going to go back to review, there, there's always going to be a folder for every day. They're going to be divided into the weeks, and then you go into the week folder, and then under that folder is going to be all of the days of that week. And, and whatever information for that day is going to be in that folder. Or sometimes there's links to videos or worksheets or, or something like that. Anything that we went over is typically going to be in those folders. So Right now, like after today, you'll if you click on lesson plans, you'll see there's week one, and then after today, there will be a folder in here that says day one. There's obviously not going to be much, you know. We we will cover. We might get into a little bit of stuff tonight, but uh, whatever we actually get into will be put into that folder, and then you can always go back into it later if needed. And then also. Like when you log on, sometimes we create the folder before class. So a lot of times the instructor will will put the information into a folder before class starts so that he can, once he starts the class, he can he can tell you guys to jump into, you know, week one, day two folder and go ahead and pull up the information as he goes over it in class. So um, just know that that's kind of where you find that stuff. That's going to be under the lesson plans. Um, 
And then, yeah, most of the other folders you're, you'll get to know as we go along. The lesson plans is the big one you need to know about now. Um, sometimes you'll see random stuff down here, like these are just uh, this air traffic control, course outline, um, FARs, practical test. So this practical test document is just a document that, that sometimes we just post documents in there um, that are just kind of aids for you to use for different things in the class. Um, but that practical test one is, is something to go over. It's a document that you can access later on when you're preparing to take your, your FAA practical test more towards the end of class. Um, the course outline is obviously in here as well. You can look at that anytime. This one that says advisory circulars, a lot of this is information that we go over in class that you'll kind of become familiar with and open up later on as well. But generally speaking, this is the home page for the Google Drive. And the big thing in now is just for you to know how to get into it and what's what, what and you know where to find the stuff. So any any questions on this, anything in here? Yeah, Adam, this yes. is Brian. Yeah. Hey, um, so I'm following along, I'm in it, but I am seeing an empty folder. Have you yeah. shared all this documentation? Okay, go back to the I'm seeing the same thing. Okay, go back. Yes. Okay, go back to the um the class. Okay, so go back to the classroom page. This the one that okay. I right know. Did you did you guys click on this this class drive folder up here at the top left? Yeah. Yeah. And it's just showing empty. Yeah, well, so Adam, when we get to classroom, one of the folders it has is Aircraft Dispatch Academy, August 2018 class, uh -huh. and that file is empty. Uh, and that's the only file that's in there. It doesn't have lesson plans or uh, whatever else you got going on, at least on my. Yeah, that's my experience, too. Okay. So it's possible that it might be duplicating it, and then it might not have you guys added to the other folder. So give me just a well I'll, I'll work on it on the next break and then um and i'll see if i can get that fixed but if you go down to this uh, try going down to this one here and clicking on this one and see if that does anything different instead of clicking on the one that says class drive folder click on the link that that I What's that? That pulled everything up. Mine was missing, but if I clicked on that link, it works now. Yeah, yeah, same. Okay. So it sounds like maybe that's. Yeah. You can download the PDF file. What's that? I think they just had to download the PDF file. That's all they had to do. Huh. Is everybody is everybody seeing it though now if they use that other link? Yeah. Okay. Wait, which link did not you use? Still trying to pull up for me. So if the link is instead of if you scroll down on that same Google Classroom page, um, if you instead of clicking on the link that's up, so what I can do is I can actually highlight this, but instead of Instead of clicking on this link here, if you scroll down on this same page and then click on click on this link right here. All right. And then I'll try to get that other class drive folder button working as well on the next break. But just as long as you guys can access it on that other link, then I just want to make sure you at least have a way of getting into it for now. Okay, was there anybody that could not access it using the other link? Hey Adam, is there an access code that I can use to get in? 
in for the Google Drive? No, just to get into the classroom. Just to the classroom? Yeah. Is it asking you for an access code? Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, I'll put it here. We can do that. Thing. It's well, I got the number right here. You want me to tell him? Yeah, I just was gonna. I'm gonna type it into the to the go to meeting chat so that you can just copy and paste it. Well, the number is one three one dash zero three one dash. That's the go to meeting. Oh, is that the wrong one? Never mind then. Okay. So <laughs> open up the go to meeting chat. It started so it's a ZQBK070. But I posted that in the chat there. You can just click on it and copy it if you want. Yeah, I got it. Thanks. Yep. Oh, I'm in. Cool. A lot of the other stuff too, like the YouTube channel. Um, once we actually get some videos posted in there, um, we'll actually kind of go into that more and, and make sure everyone is familiar with how to use those. But the link in there, the link on that about page that takes you to the YouTube channel, it'll actually start having, you know, you, I think you'll get emails when those uh, videos get uploaded. The other thing too is that all of the videos on this uh, classroom materials page on the about page, anytime we do a video, we'll also put the link to that video right here on this page as well. So sometimes you don't even necessarily have to go to the YouTube channel. Um, you'll just see a, a link in here that just says um, week one, day two class video, and you can just click on it straight from the classroom and it should take you right into it as well. So all of those videos should be posted in, in here as well as seeing them in the YouTube channel. Anybody have any questions on anything? Good. Okay, cool. So that kind of just briefly kind of goes over the, the, the stuff that we use. Um, like I said, as long as you're into the, the, Google, the Google Classroom site, you, you can access pretty much any of the other stuff straight from here. Um, and like I said, too, we, we are definitely learning ourselves more and more about the Google Classroom functionality and, and how to do the assignments and stuff. So, um, <clears throat> but we'll, we'll get it all figured out as well. But it, it, it seems like it's a lot better and a more kind of centralized place to, to host everything than, than how we've had it in the past. So it should be friendly, I'm hoping. Um, cool, well that's pretty much it for that part of it. Unless anybody has questions about that stuff, everything that you need for the class, as far as materials, stuff that you need to read, anything like that, is going to be on the either on this classroom page or in that Google in the, one of those Google Drive folders. So um, we have everything available in PDF format. Feel free to print off anything that you want. Like I know people are a little bit different. Like some people like to have you know physical copies of stuff um and you know we're, i guess we're kind of in one of those ages now where like we try to be green with everything so um what we've done here is just simply made it available to you um electronically but if you would like to print it out feel free to print it and make a notebook out of it whatever you want but all of the material um is either already there now or will be added into there 
as we go along, depending on, you know, where, we, where we're at in the class. So, um, like I said, though, you can always print stuff out and make, you know, if you want to print stuff out to read or make notebooks or, or however, whatever works best for you, um, feel free to, to do that. It is your information to have. Um, <clears throat> let's see. So kind of what I wanted to transition over to now is start, let's uh, start um, talking. Let's open up the, um, if you guys are in here, let's open up the, uh, the course outline for a second. So you can actually just, click on that directly from the classroom. So the course outline here is going to give you kind of an idea of how, you know, what subjects are taught and when they're taught and what we're going to be covering on any given day. Now, um, just know ahead of time that this this isn't like a firm schedule because every class is a little bit unique in in the way it operates and like the ways like things fall on certain days and you know sometimes we spend more time on other topics and sometimes some topics flow into another day than just the one that they're assigned to so so this isn't like you know, dead set schedule, you know, exactly where we're going to be on exactly every single day. But just kind of know, generally speaking, this is this is how we're going to go through the course. And for the most part, it'll stay true to what you're seeing. Um, we like I said, we constantly make little modifications to the class. Um, and a lot of this is based on feedback from the students. Um, we're we're tr we're always trying to fine tune it to to spend more time on the areas that we feel are more valuable to you in this class. We know that it's a, a condensed eight week format. There's a ton of information in here, and I think the most important thing for you guys to know ahead of time is that although we are going to cover a ton of information in here, there. There's a like I was saying earlier, this class, there's a lot of stuff in here that the FAA makes us cover that a lot of that material is stuff that, you know, a lot of it is is modern day dispatch and is pertinent to what you guys need to know for now. Uh, you know, nowadays as a dispatcher. However, a lot of it, being that it's regulated by a government agency. A lot of it is outdated as well, but we still are mandated to cover it in this class. In order to be an FAA-approved course, we have to check the boxes on everything that they say we need to check the boxes on, even though a lot of that information is not necessarily valuable to modern-day dispatch. So we are going to do our best at all times in this class as instructors to make sure that we spend the far majority of this class talking about the items that you guys need to know on being a dispatcher in the present day and what's going to be most valuable for you guys to take from this class and transition it into actually a dispatcher career working for an airline. Um, we're going to try to give you the information that's most valuable for you to pass the ADX written test and the FA practical test. And you're gonna hear us say, we, we will always precursor a lot of the things that we say in this class as, you know, we'll, we'll tell you ahead of time saying like, this is something that we're covering that, you know, that there's a lot of things in here that we cover that you're, you're, the only time you're ever going to hear it is going to be in this class, and then you'll probably never hear about it again ever in the rest of your dispatch lives will ever hear about it. And some of that stuff is, you know, even though we have to cover it, we, uh, we kind of just check the box on it a little bit, and we spend a little bit less time on it if it's not something that's going to help you um, now, you know, as a dispatcher. 
And if it's not something that you need to pass a quiz or pass a test at, you know, during this class. So if, when there's stuff that we absolutely want you to memorize and absolutely want you to know in this class, we will almost always tell you right before we talk about it, we will almost always say, this is something that you all must know. This is something that you are going to want to write down, want to memorize, study, highlight, put it in bold letters, however is best for you as students to, to grasp that, you know, whatever we're about to talk about is, is important. And not to say that the other stuff's not important, but the big topics in here, the stuff that we really want you to focus on, really want you to memorize, we will tell you right as we're talking about it or right before we're about to talk about it, that it's something like, hey, please pay attention to this and write this down and, you know, remember where this is at on the recording if you need to go back to it to, to, to go back and study. And <clears throat> the reason we obviously do this is because there's so much information in this class that if you try to like take everything that we talk about and and remember it and 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 focus on it in your heads to and it, you're just going to become completely overwhelmed with the class and that's not what we want we we want to sift through the the information that is essential for what you need to be as a dispatcher and essential for passing this class and then the stuff that's kind of more non-essential but stuff we still have to cover in in some ways really just to say that we covered it to check the box. So if you if you can try to listen for those cues and and feel free to ask at any time like feel free to question us and say hey was this something that we need to memorize is this something you know if if you didn't hear it or if we didn't say it um or if you're just wondering or maybe you missed that part or something feel free to ask us at any time as you know if this is something that is essential um, and, and I, like I say, I, I say this cautiously, obviously, because I don't want any of you to feel like everything else that we don't, that we don't, you know, put those statements in front of. I don't want you to feel that that information is not information that you need to know. Um, because the, the truth is, is that in this career, in this profession, there's a lot of information and, and in this class even like I said, you're going to be drinking from a fire hose, but what we really want you to take from this class is the stuff that is going to make you be a good dispatcher now and the essential stuff that you need to get through your tests and to get your licenses. The majority of the learning that you do as a dispatcher honestly comes in the field. It comes on the job and it comes in and going through your the classes that you take once you get hired as a dispatcher, because every airline is a little bit different on how they operate. And there they have different airplanes. They have different policies and procedures. And so we don't want to get too wrapped around the axles in this class with information that might be taught different differently to you once you get hired as a dispatcher. We want to kind of stick to the basics in here and get you the information that you need to know to become a knowledgeable dispatcher and even realizing that once you get your license out of this course that you're really you know you're really at square one you know you still have a lot to learn and you know the the big thing that you want to know from this class is what are the rules and regulations of a dispatcher you know how how certain things work like air traffic control flight planning, navigation, different things like that. You want to be able to grasp those concepts and grasp certain concepts like about um, aircraft systems and how those work. And because generally speaking, we're, we're going to talk about aviation in, in a generalized manner in this course. Even though we have a specific aircraft that we're going to talk about in this class, the, the systems, when we talk about that aircraft, the systems of that aircraft that you're going to learn about are going to be the same whether it's in that aircraft or if it's in a different aircraft or because you know 
you'll, you're going to dispatch different planes throughout your careers. And the principles of flight always remain the same. The principles of certain aircraft systems will always remain the same as well. And so just kind of know, I just, I, I like to kind of get this out in front on on day one for you guys to kind of know ahead of ahead that you're going to have a lot of information poured all over, you know, and you're going to have stuff that you're going to feel very confused. You're going to feel like the class may be overwhelming. You're going to feel like you're struggling. I mean, th this is, this is all going to be very common stuff, but just know that, uh, we're going to reduce it down to really kind of get it to the meat and potatoes of what you need to know to, to get through the class, to get your license and to really to prepare you for the, the goal of this class really in, in addition to getting the license and getting you to, you know, to that point to where you can, you know, efficiently pass the tests required to get your licenses, but also to prepare you for, your first airline interview as a dispatcher and to do well in those interviews. That's the, really the goal here because once you get hired on with an airline, they're going to train you the way that they want you to be at that particular airline. And a lot of those things are going to be different than, than how you may hear about some of the things in this class. Now this class does teach specifically more to the SkyWest airlines method of doing things. And and that's because, you know, this class, you know, all of the instructors work for SkyWest. I worked for SkyWest for six years myself. Um, the airplane that we use in this course is SkyWest. Um, not to say that they don't use it at other airlines, but everything in this class is based on SkyWest policy and procedures. And so you come out of this class really being really prepared for a SkyWest interview. And, and and I don't want to like say that you're limited to Sky West by any means, but um, <clears throat> obviously the majority of people in this class, you know, living in St. George and things like that, that's usually the, the, the objective is to either get to Sky West or get to Sky West and then go somewhere else or, or whatever, you know, your goal might be. But once you have a, a, the, uh, your, your license out of this class, you can go to any airline. Your your that license can take you anywhere. So you're not obviously limited to SkyWest. Um, but so the way we try to teach in this class is really the generalized principles of aviation and the generalized principles of dispatch. And so that you know that whether you take it to SkyWest or whether you go somewhere else, it's going to be the same. Those those specific things. And then once you get on. Uh, you know, take a job with any of those other places, um, anything that's not specific to, to general aviation is going to be taught to you at those places. So you're going to feel like you want to like learn all this additional stuff, but just know that in a way, and in a sense, you kind of have to keep yourself bridled a little bit um, as to not be drifting off into things that really come later. And, even though a lot of the other information that I was saying that we that we talk about in this class might seem non-essential, um, <clears throat> it's still information that down the road is going to be useful for you. It might not be something that you necessarily need to know right now to get your license, but it is valuable information for the future. And that's one thing that you're going to realize about dispatch is that it is a never-ending learning environment. Um, if you've been there for, for one year, five years, 10 years, 20 years, it doesn't matter. It's, it's one of those jobs where the learning never stops. The technology constantly changes. The, the, there's always so many differences. And you're never, ever going to see the same thing two days in a row. It's one of those jobs where it's dynamically changing, constantly changing. So, And because of that, you never stop learning. And you can dive into more of those more broad topics, stuff that we don't necessarily cover here or stuff that we just lightly cover in class. Um, might be something that you get into five years down the road that uh, might help you. You know, all of it will help you 
ultimately down the road. But the goal of this class is really to get you the basic principles, get you the license, and prepare you for an interview. Because we have eight weeks, and that, that's pretty much, you know, doing more than that just puts all the extra stress on on doing more than really you need to do. So um, hopefully that sits well with everybody. And, and, you know, if there's ever a point in the class where you're feeling overwhelmed, you know, feel free to talk to us on the side, um, ask questions, email. Almost all of us are always going to be available, text, email, phone calls. Um, and like I said, you know, by the end of this, you'll have – all of our phone numbers and emails to, to rely on us at any, any time you need us to ask questions or anything else. And not even that, just one, when the class is done and you're licensed and gone on, we're always here. Like we, we stay in communication with everybody from all of our previous classes and anything that can, you know, help us with the class or anything just generally speaking in the dispatch world, we always want to hear from you about anything that we can answer anytime going forward. We're always, we're always here. So um, just always know that going forward and, and, you know, always feel free to, to talk to us. So, so anyway, this is the course outline um, other than just kind of scrolling through it here. You can kind of, you know, on your own, if you want to take a look at the outline, you can kind of see that, um, you know, where we're going to be week three, week four, week five. You can kind of see all the different things that we cover in here. It is a lot of information, and uh, <clears throat> we will get through all of it. So um, let's go ahead and take another 10-minute uh, break real quick. I like to always do, so that's the other thing you're going to kind of notice. We usually try to take a break, um, usually a 10 to 15 minute break, um, usually anywhere between 60, every 60 to 90 minutes, just depending on where we're at subject wise. If obviously we don't want to stop in the middle of talking about something important to take a break, but um, generally speaking, um, we like to take some sort of a break every 60 to 90 minutes. Um, and sometimes, you know, with certain instructors too, they do, they do it a little bit differently. Um, sometimes we take more of an extended break, like, because we realize that from 5.30 to 9.30, a lot of people sometimes want to, you know, make some dinner real quick. So sometimes you'll, you'll see that we might take like a 20 to 30 minute break on, you know, at some time during the class. And that usually is, uh, you know, that'll usually happen once during any class, but that's usually more for like a dinner break or something like that if needed. Um, but that kind of also just kind of goes more by what you guys are needing and wanting at the time as well. So, um, but also feel free to chime in. If, if sometimes, like I know for myself personally, like I can kind of get talking and I can just ramble on and not realize that I've gone way past 60 or 90 minutes without a break. If you guys ever feel like we've gone too long without a break or whatever, please chime in and and say something about, you know, hey, can we take a break or whatever. Don't ever hesitate on that because sometimes we just forget. We get talking and we just it just slips our mind. So um, remember that as well. But I usually try to take some sort of a break every, at least, you know, every 60 to 90 minutes. And I think most of the other instructors do as well. So let's go ahead and take a break again and just uh, – uh, Let's say at seven seven thirty three, jump back on. Sounds good. Okay. We. Yeah. So these are federal aviation regulations that we're going to kind of read through a little bit here, but part of these are kind of go through what the eligibility requirements are for the course and kind of what you're going to, some of the expectations that you can have as the, you know, as you go through the course. So I don't want to read a lot of this verbatim because it, uh, you're going to realize, and, and especially the rest of this week, because the very first thing we talk about is federal aviation regulations. And one thing that you're going to quickly realize about those is that they are, 
a nightmare to just sit there and read through. And they're they're written in in legal speak, and so a lot of the verbiage and and repetition of of things in there just kind of really starts, you know, it uh, it's a nightmare. Let's just put it that way to to sit there and and just read through them. So we try to make it as fun as we can, but know ahead of time that it's just not that fun, and and uh, it's probably. Um, one of the more boring parts of class, but uh, unfortunately, it's something that the FAA says we have to cover. And there is some stuff in there that is going to be, you know, essential for passing the class as well. But let's start off here. We've got the eligibility requirements for the class. Um, <clears throat> so like I said, I'm not going to just sit here and read these, but I'll, I'll touch on each one of these things. So the first thing is here, it says the authority to act as an aircraft dispatcher requires an aircraft dispatcher certificate. And it's issued under um, Part 65 of the Federal Aviation Regulations. To be eligible to receive an aircraft dispatcher certificate, a person must comply with the following requirements. So you have to be at least 23 years of age. And that's requirement number one. I don't know where they came up with the... Uh, 23 years um, requirement. Um, just as an example, in order to be um, an airline pilot, a commercial pilot, you only have to be 18 years old. So to be an airline dispatcher, you have to be 23. So like I said, I don't know where that comes from, but uh, that's the first requirement. You have to be at least 23 or older. Secondly, you have to be able to read, speak, write, and understand the English language. Um, obviously, the English language requirement is mostly because the FAA oversees, you know, all aviation in the United States, and our primary language is English. But in addition to that, um, on a global scale, air traffic control is all in English regardless of where you fly. So if you end up being a pilot and you're flying over in China, air traffic control is always in English, regardless of where you're at. That's, that's, a, that's just a, a nation, or not, I should say a global requirement. So even if you have a Chinese airline with Chinese pilots flying inside of China, talking to Chinese air traffic control, they're still supposed to be speaking English. So um, that's one of the reasons why you gotta know English. Um, the next thing is pass the required knowledge test, which is the ADX. You'll hear us talk about that a lot in this course. Um, the ADX is the written test that's required to be passed before you take the practical test and it's so there's two big tests that you got to take with the FAA. The first one is the ADX, that's the written test. And then after you pass that, you can take the practical test. Um, if any of you guys have, you know, I know most of you guys have received like the, you know, the, the, inf the informational email I probably sent to all of you guys before signing up for the class that talks about studying for the ADX test and downloading the software for the ADX test and getting as much of a head start as you possibly can before the class started. And I also realized that the majority, you know, then this is kind of the way every one of our classes goes, but um, several people join the class, you know, within the last week or two before the class starts. And so it doesn't give people much time to obviously start uh, studying and passing the ADX. But in the case of, um, you know, when you um, sign up and, you know, the class is still six to eight weeks out, um, sometimes it gives you a, a good head start to be able to jump in, start studying, and, and getting as far as you can on the ADX. So just kind of uh, whoever wants to chime in, has anybody um, been able to do much studying as far as this test is concerned yet? I've studied quite a bit so far. This is Tara. Tara. 
Okay. Yeah. How do you feel that studying has gone? Like, what do you, what do you think so far of like the different things you've been seeing? It's overwhelming. Yeah. Because they give you all this information, but then you have to sort of, I don't know, take their snippet, snippets of it and make it make sense. And it's, it's confusing and it takes hours and hours. Yep. Um, are they going to have something for us to look at? Because with the memory aids, that's one question I have. With the memory aids that they have, they have it so that we understand it. Are we able to take any of that in with the test with us? Um, not the memory aid, no. Um, the, so, yeah, you technically can't take anything in other than like a calculator. And I think they actually provide you with a calculator. But all of the – like the – Anything like that they that they use for the test, like the graphics or any of that stuff, is is obviously in there with it. But yeah, nothing as far as a preparation materials that you have, you can't take anything in. So a lot of it is just going through the motions of of studying. So uh, of studying that you know those memory aids and things like that and. That's that's obviously why we try to start really pushing the ADX preparation as early as we can, even 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 well before the class starts. In in some of your cases, be, you know those of you that sign up early enough, like you know like in your case, Tara, and I think Brian as well, um, Brian. And also, if you want to chime in, kind of let us know how yours has been going. I know we talked a little bit a few weeks ago about it, um, but how's yours been going? Uh, it's been driving me bonkers. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, you'll be going along, all of a sudden you'll get into a rhythm, things will start to make sense, and all of a sudden there'll be something really random that pops in there, like in the navigation section, the 60 to 1 rule. And it's like, what in the world is that? And then you stop, you look it up, you figure it out, and you're like, okay. But, yeah, there's uh, I keep running into things that feel like mental speed bumps. Yeah. But um, but uh, for those of you, it, <laughs> I went like three weeks before I figured out that, it, like, especially in the, the weather section, uh, if you're using the Shepherd Air stuff, um, the question will, like, refer to Appendix 2, Figure, whatever. Um, there's actually a little button right there in the question that says Figures. You click that, it'll actually show you the visual of what they're asking in the question. So I went three weeks without actually seeing those. So, uh, yeah, don't be, don't, you know, so, <laughs> yeah, I, I think I slapped my head against the wall so hard that I nearly gave myself a concussion on the <laughs> that up. Yeah, 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 it does. The, the software is pretty, it's pretty good as far as what it does. It it, one thing that we run into with every class so far, and, and this is not just the classes like, you know, with Aircraft Dispatch Academy. This is going to be true of anybody that's taken the course at any class. And any of the classes that I used to teach at Salt Lake Community College or in this, you know, with this company, it's it's always the same. It's the ADX is one of the biggest hurdles in preparing for you know in, in getting the license and uh, the reason why is because the adx it is an faa test um you know which once again we're gonna um talk about you know the fact that it's a government regulated entity and it's a government test and it's a very outdated test and the test itself is also very pilot um oriented and a lot of it has absolutely nothing to do with dispatch, unfortunately. Um, but that's that's a lot due to the fact that it just hasn't been updated in several years. And it uh, even when you consider like this class and, and like going through the eight weeks that we go through in this course, a lot of it we don't we don't touch on a lot of the concepts that you have to learn for the ADX to pass the ADX because it's not something that's essential for dispatch anymore. And so we don't talk about it. So a lot of 
the studying and preparation for the ADX has to be done outside of class. Um, we'll talk about it in class and we'll talk about like where everyone's at and everyone struggles and things like that. But the stuff that you're looking at in there is really not stuff that we need to, that we talk about in here. It doesn't cross over. It's not something that we use. And the only thing that I can really say is that it's kind of one of those unfortunate things at this point in time that we still have to do in order to get our dispatch licenses. Um, and so as part of that, the reason we recommend the Shepherd Air software is because it seems like it's the software that has been the most um, useful, I guess I should say, or the most successful with our students um, in preparing them. It, it teaches you kind of a memorization pattern for some of the questions. So one thing that, and, and I tell this, I remember, you know, I was having the same conversation with Brian a few weeks ago over email, but one of the things that, and everybody's learning styles is going to be different. And, and I can tell you for me, like when I'm going through a test or whatever, like I want to understand what it's talking about. And one of the big things about the ADX, especially for those of you that don't have much in the way of aviation backgrounds. You're going to be reading through some of these questions and you're not going to have a clue as to what it's talking about or even what it is that it's talking about. And somehow between you not having any knowledge of the question at all or what it's even referring to, you're supposed to like memorize, you know, or, or understand it or pass it or, you know, get the question right. So, the ADX, or sorry, the Shepherd Air program, and, and they, they, do, um, they do software programs for the ADX, for the ATP, for all sorts of different FAA tests. And they basically teach you how to memorize some of the answer, like uh, the bulk of the answers by, by using different little methods. Like if it's talking, like it'll teach you, like if it's talking about this airplane, um, and if it's this certain topic, it's always going to be the, the lowest answer, or it's always going to be the middle answer or the highest answer. So I know a lot of you guys probably haven't even touched ADX studying or preparation yet, but just know ahead of time that it's, you know, it's, it's, it's a little bit of a, it's, it's definitely a bump in the road as far as the preparation and, and studying for it, but also one thing important to know is that is that you have to you kind of have to forget about trying to learn all of the topics and just simply sometimes you just have to just trust the method of the Shepherd Air program and even though you have no clue as to what it's talking about, you just have to learn the method of, of memorization on the answers to get through it the quickest and really hey Adam. yeah this is davis i actually did the shepherd air and it was a huge hassle it was i mean completing the adx was a, a huge pain um but going through the shepherd air it's just you have to memorize everything and you'll even find out that there's different variations of questions which okay. seem like completely to contradict themselves you just have to find little ways of memorizing those two. But once you can get this thing done and out of the way, the sooner the better. Yeah. So, so I mean, so in your, from your standpoint, like, like, do you, what are your thoughts on the Shepherd Air program then? Uh, I thought it worked great. Um, when I was going through, uh, I'm not a huge, like, read it, memorize it kind of guy, but after I read the software, somebody told me they were like, just buy into what they're doing, buy into what they say, um, do exactly what they tell you to do. Uh, it's going to tell you to go through and like for each section, like memorize the questions and then go back through them and do them in a different order and see how you do then and then move to the next section. If you do it exactly how it says to do it, um, everyone that I've known has had really good success with it. And um, it takes a lot of time, though. You just have to a lot. 
you know, an hour here, an hour there to sit down and do, you know, a whole section. And some of the sections don't take you very long. Some of the sections do, um, but it works great when it's used the way they want it to. Yeah, that, and that's good to hear. And that's that's honestly the the thing about me is that like Shepherd Air didn't exist when I took the tests, and you know, back fifteen years ago. So it 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 wasn't. It's not something that I've ever done personally. So I, I rely on hearing the feedback from students taking it, and then obviously people like you know, like Davis here, and and even as you guys go through here, you know, as classmates. Um, you know, whoever the first person is to pass it will probably be able to pass on a wealth of information as far as what you need to do to, to get through it. Um, but yes, the common thing that I hear from everybody that takes it and does the shepherd air method is that you have, you absolutely have to buy in to their method and you have to follow it verbatim. And I think the biggest problem that people run into is that based on individual learning styles, you want to modify it and make it your own little thing or, or do unique little changes to adjust for your own learning style. And that seems to be the biggest hiccup that everyone has in actually getting through it. They, they dismiss some of the ideology of the Shepherd Air method and it completely sidelines them. And that's... Like I said, I've never went through it myself, um, but that seems to be the common theme. And just as Davis was just saying, I mean, that's just another person in that column of people that I've hear say that. And almost, and I think that you guys will be the same as once you, you know, once any of you guys that start buying into the Shepherd Air program and and that method and just doing it exactly the way it says. That's really the only thing I can say is that just follow it and do it just as prescribed and the quicker the better because the one thing about the ADX test is that it's the only thing that's going to keep you from being able to take the practical test. So um, a lot of times, and I realize that it's hard to try to do the ADX on the side while you're going through the eight week course, because you already have all the information being thrown at you here. And then you've got to find time to somehow do this on the side, but people kind of do it in different ways. Some, some for, you know, and like I said, this is kind of going to be like where your learning styles are going to have variations in them. But some people try to do it while they're doing the course. And, and a lot of it just depends on what your lifestyle is like outside of this class. And some people have that time, you know, between family, kids, other work obligations, things like that. I don't, I don't know everyone's situations, but sometimes people just don't even worry about the ADX until like the end. And then they take like two weeks at the end and just do it then. And it works fine that way. Um, some people do it while they're doing the class and they seem to get through it, but just do whatever works for you. Don't feel like, you know, like you've got to be absolutely ready to go by the end of these eight weeks. Like if you're not done with the ADX test, you know, if you need to take a week or two to finish it up at the end, that's fine. Now, like I said, it, it will keep you from being able to take the practical test because in order to take the practical, you have to have your ADX certificate completed and you have to take that to the practical as well as, you know, getting signed off from us in the, as your instructors to be able to take the practical. But, but that's usually not the problem. It's usually the ADX that might pose the problem. And you'll see that everybody in the class, it'll probably get down to crunch time and everyone will be talking ADX a lot the last couple of weeks and it'll kind of be a headache, but, um, I trust that everyone will get through it. Just kind of know that ahead of time. The more you know ahead of time, then I think the more you're able to deal with that and get through it and and make it work better for everybody. So, um, so yeah, the cost on the prep wear for the Shepherd Air is is eighty five dollars. Um, one thing I know. 
I've been, I think somebody in the last class like found like a link to, I don't know if it's like a, a sharing website or something where they, they have a lot of like the, I think the same stuff shared on like, I, I can't, I'll, I'll have to go through and find out exactly where it was, but I think some of the information you can kind of get from sharing websites um, if you don't want to have to like pay the $85. Also, several people in the last class kind of just shared the information, but like somebody bought it and then, you know, they split it and, and they shared it that way. Um, other methods that aren't the shepherd air method are, are just, you can, you can study like the, the, the FAA actually gives out like a free, you know, test book that you can actually download right from the FAA.gov website. So there are other methods of doing it, but I always push the shepherd air method because people seem to get the best scores and get it done the quickest by doing it that way. Hey, uh, this is Brian. If I can make a point about the shepherd air, uh -huh. it's kind of old technology that you have to download directly to a device. So um, if you're going to share it and you download it to say an iPad, for whatever reason, it doesn't work on Android devices. But if you download it to like an iPhone or an iPad, then yeah, it's pretty much stored on the device itself. So it's really, you know, at that point, it would be pretty easy to share. But um, otherwise, it downloads directly to a device. And so keep that in mind if you're trying to work with other people that there are some Without the physical device, it complicates it greatly. Yeah, yeah, I've heard that too. Like, because I think it can only go onto one device or something, right? Yeah, and you actually, if you want to switch it to a different device, you actually have to call Shepherd Air, and then they'll go, they'll do the uninstall for you. Then you can re-download, but they actually limit the number of times you can do that as well. I think they said that there's a max. Um, reinstall of two times before it just won't reinstall. Okay. So kind of real old school software technology, but there you are. Yeah. And I think what people did in the last classes um, were, I think they just accessed it from their device and did screenshots. And then I think that they posted like the screenshots of all of the information on there, like on to like, the Google drive folder for everybody to access or something like that. But so I think that was kind of what they did, but I'm not sure. I'll, I know Garrett, um, tomorrow night when Garrett gets on, he, he'll kind of, he'll be able to probably talk a lot more at length about the shepherd air stuff and what are the, because he did that shepherd air method as well. And he did that. Uh, he, he kind of talks a lot more about that specifically as well. So, but anyway, also, also one last thing I was if you do want to pay for it, I was able to get it at 75, not 85, because I told him that's what the email said. And she was like, OK, we'll honor that. Oh, yeah, yeah, exactly. So I mean, it's 10 bucks. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. And somewhere in the midst of uh, of somewhere over the last couple of months, I think they 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 moved it from 75 to 85. But yeah, they. uh we just put the link on there and we didn't, we didn't know that it changed until somebody brought it to our attention. So, um, but the, uh, th there are other books and things like that too, that we have, um, access to that aren't shepherd air that we can also, if anybody wants, we can get, um, that we get like discounts from, from different vendors, like kind of, we, we buy them a little bit more in bulk, but, um, but anyway, you can contact me offline if, if anybody's interested in that. So any other questions on the ADX? Okay. Um, so, so yeah, so obviously the ADX, passing the ADX is a requirement. It says then to be eligible to take the, the required knowledge test, a person must be 21 years of age. So that just means 
you have to be 21 to take the ADX. You also have to be 21 to take the practical, um, but you've got to be 23 to get your license. So we've had students um, in the past and that have taken the class before turning 23. So, and I think we have um, maybe even one or two in this class that aren't quite yet 23. And what uh, you do in that situation is you still, as long as, long as you're 21, you can take all the tests and take the class and you can pass it and be all ready to go. And you can take the practical, you can pass it. But the only thing is, is you just can't get your license. And so um, once you get passed and get done with everything and you pass the practical test, you, they actually give you a letter and it's called a, le a letter of aeronautical competency. And they give you this letter that just says that so-and-so has completed all the requirements for the FAA dispatcher license other than the age requirement. And then on your 23rd birthday, you can actually take that piece of paper into the FAA office and hand it to them. And then they will print you out a temporary dispatcher license. And then your real one will come in the mail, um, you know, within a few weeks after that. <coughs> for those of you guys that are already 23 or older, when you pass the practical test, right at the end of that test, you will be printed out there on the spot a, a temporary dispatcher license, which is just as valid as your normal license, other than it's just your temporary one. And then your, you know, your actual one comes in the mail um, within usually a, a few weeks of that. So um, as far as requirements of this course, so the graduation requirements are students must complete and be present for 200 hours of instruction. So that's kind of where you get the whole makeup of the eight week course. Um, the 200 hours, um, so it says must complete and be present for. So we all realize um, and you can even see in the lines below this, it says students must attend 85% or more of all classes and webinars. So um, we obviously like you present as much as possible in the live session format. And then obviously when we have class, <clears throat> um, the in class, uh, we like, you know, to be present for all of those as well. Um, we also understand, though, that things happen and, you know, that people have families and things like that outside of just this class. So what we ask and kind of what we expect is that to the extent that you can control your schedules, we ask that you be present for the class. Um, I understand, you know, with some people's works and things like that, occasionally they'll have to miss a class. And that's why we do the YouTube channel recordings. That's why we make this content accessible so that somebody that did have to miss a class um, can watch the class the next day and still stay on track. We, we like people to be able to stay with the class as much as possible. Um, and we realize that there's some things that you just can't control. And obviously that's why we have leniency in this, but you know, we just don't, we don't want any of those like missing class and things like that to become the norm. So we would definitely want you present as much as possible. And when you can't be present uh, for the online classes or the in-class portion, once we get there, please just send us an email or a text message or something, just letting us know. Cause you know, a lot of times when we begin the class, sometimes we, we usually try and wait for everybody to log on. And if it's going to be a class that you're going to miss, let us know in a, ahead so that we're not waiting to start the class. And like I said, you know, um, you know, try to be there as much as possible and, and try not to abuse that policy as well. Um, but obviously we, you know, we make accommodations for things that come up and things that happen that are outside of your control. And, uh, and uh, we still provide a method of you to staying caught up as well if you do have to miss. So uh, the 200 hours is a combination of the class as well as the in-class as well as a light amount of outside preparation that also counts towards that. So we easily get to the 200. I think we actually get closer to like 240 in the class. So um, students must pass a weekly quiz. There's 
that says eight, but technically there's only six quizzes. We base it off of the subject. There's six total quizzes that you have to get a score of 80% or higher on each quiz. Um, we do allow retakes on all of the quizzes as well, unlimited retakes. So, um, you know, we're, we're, we're going to make it so that, uh, you know, you guys pass. And, you know, we don't, we kind of say that, you know, like, we don't necessarily make it easy, but, you know, we all know that everybody in the class has a vested interest, obviously, in, in passing. And you wouldn't be here, you wouldn't pay the money to be in the class, as well as be being, you know, wasting your time with us four hours a day if, if you, you know, didn't have that objective to get through it. And so we obviously, we don't, we don't babysit any of these particular things. We don't, you know, we treat it more like a college course, um, you know, to be present and to do your studying and things like that. Um, we also don't necessarily care about like, like the way that we do the quizzes, um, a lot of, it always comes up every class that, that you would, the, we ask that you don't use like your classroom materials when you take the quiz, but we also don't police any of that. Like we don't police cheating on quizzes in any way because we know that everybody in the class, you know, you, you didn't pay to get in this class just to cheat yourself. So we don't, you know, it's not going to be something that we're going to sit there and police when we know that, you know, obviously everybody is mature and, you know, and that if you did choose to, uh, on any of these online quizzes, you could easily cheat and get 80% or higher just by looking at your material. But, you know, obviously in the end, you're just cheating yourself. So, because you can cheat on the quizzes, but you can't cheat once you get to the ADX, or you can't cheat on the practical. So... Um, obviously it's in everyone's best interest to put away the materials and, you know, not look at answers and just honestly assess yourself on each quiz on where you're actually at. And if you get below an 80%, you know, we, we, we go over the answers to every quiz and you can immediately retake that quiz and get 80% or higher. So it's not necessarily ever a big deal if you get less than 80% because you could take it the next day and get a hundred percent. Um, the key is for us is that you just know the material. And if you don't happen to know it, when you take the quiz, if you get below the 80%, well, you know, we give you the answers and we're very confident that once you learn that answer and you learn that that was a quiz question, that that's going to be something that sticks that you can look back on and study. And at that point forward, we're, we're pretty confident that it's going to be something you're going to remember. So, um, so the retention of the 80% or higher going forward is, is something that almost always happens, even if you get less than 80% initially. So uh, students must pass a final exam at the end of the course covering all the subject matter with a score of 80%. This is basically saying that we have kind of a comprehensive test at the end. If, if you save all your quizzes and then at the very end of the course, just simply study all of those quizzes, that's basically what makes up the comprehensive exam at the end. It's, it's a mixture of, of all of your quizzes. So each quiz you take, there's like, once again, there's six quizzes. Each quiz is going to have anywhere between 10 to 15 questions on each quiz. And the comprehensive exam usually takes maybe three or four questions from every single quiz and puts it all together at the end for a comprehensive test. So, but it's the same questions you see in the quizzes. It's not going to be different. Um, students obviously must pass the ADX knowledge test. Um, on the ADX, I, we didn't touch on this earlier, but the score you need to get there is 70% or better. So 70% is usually pretty achievable. Um, it's an 80 question test and you have three hours to take the test. So, in fact, I was hearing that I think maybe they even added on an extra hour. It might be four hours now, but um, either way, though, three or four hours, it's 80 questions. So you need to get 56 questions right in order to get 70%. So just remember that. We're going to talk about methods of taking the ADX over the, um, you know, during this course that you know we'll talk about 
several different things that might help you when you actually go to take it. So we won't touch on it too much right now. Um, at the end of the course, uh, students must turn in five completed flight plan packets. Talk about that more later, but that's more when we get into the in-class portion when we do the manual flight planning. Um, upon completion of the graduation requirements above, students will receive a graduation certificate that fulfills the requirement um, from the Federal Aviation Regulations. Students receiving a graduation certificate will be referred to take the aircraft dispatcher practical test. The graduation certificate is valid for 90 days from the date received. After 90 days, the certificate is void and the student must be revalidated by us. And if we determine that the student still is at a proficient level, then we will issue a new graduation certificate and it's valid for an additional 90 days. So typically we've, we've never really ever had to do this because everyone in class that wants to take the ADX and you know be licensed is usually licensed within two to three weeks after the class ends. So, um, but just know that if something comes up during the class that you have to, you know, take some time off or, or whatever, you know, we've had situations in the past where, you know, people have gotten sick. Um, there's been family emergency events that have gone on that, that people have even had to drop out of the class and, and then resume it in the next class. And, and so there's some students that we're still working f with from last year that had to that had to you know drop out of the course at the time. So one thing with us here is that once you've paid to be in this class, you have access to this class obviously and any class going forward. So if you have something that comes up in this class which is not going to allow you to complete it, um, you're not you're not done. Your money's not lost. Um, you can, you have access to this class anytime going forward. If you, if you can't complete it in this eight week course, we will always continue to work with you. If you have the interest in being certified as a dispatcher, we will make sure you get there and you're not gonna have to pay any additional money um, or any, you have access to every class in the future for free and we will always be there if you know if you're determined to get it we'll make sure you get it and if uh, this whole 90 day thing once you get issued the graduation certificate um, the only time that this would really ever play a role is if something did come up that you had to take some time off from the class and you were still continuing on um, trying to get it finished up afterwards or if you finished the class but let's say you didn't have the ADX done you could get, we can issue you a graduation certificate even though you haven't passed the ADX. Um, and some then, you know, sometimes people take an extended amount of time to pass the ADX. Um, but like I said, that's actually never happened to where it's gone more than 90 days. But um, just know that the graduation certificate's good for 90 days. And as long as you take the practical, you know, get the ADX passed in that time frame then you you know that's not even going to be an issue um it talks about the attendance again there um the faa kind of has a written requirement that says 85 percent attendance but like i said that if, if you miss a class and then watch it the next day and then pass the quiz that week in my opinion i consider you having attended 100 percent that week so um in completion of course requirements in the event that a student does not complete all of the course requirements, a statement of incompletion will be given. That that statement will list the number of hours completed as well as the test scores received in each area. All hours completed, scores received, as well as the reason for incompletion will be noted on the student's record. And then we maintain all of those records and hours, and then they, they can be credited towards future classes as determined by us as the course operator. This here kind of talks about the overall hours of the class. We spend 20 hours on FA regulations, 40 hours on meteorology, 25 on navigation, 30 hours on aircraft systems, and so on. You can kind of see practical dispatch, 40 hours, flight planning, 60 hours. You can kind of see everything. This is our sources of information. If anyone's interested, this is where we get all of the information for, for the class.
Anybody have any questions as far as the requirements for the class, the eligibility, um, the expectations for attendance, anything like that? Any any questions at all? Uh, yeah, with the practical, do you do that or does somebody else? What's the process for that? Um, <clears throat> so the practical is we, we do all the scheduling for it and we um, we facilitate all of it. However, it's administered by an FAA dispatch examiner. Um, and in your case, Trevin, um, I'm not sure. Have you ever met Greg Brooks? I haven't. I know of him, but no, I haven't met him. Okay, so he works at SkyWest, um, but he is the dispatch examiner. Um, he's not okay. not like an FAA employee or anything like that, but he is an FAA certified examiner, and he's the one that will do all of your exams. So um, he's he's a really you know really good guy. Everyone you know you get along with him, and he's really easy to take a test with and make you feel really comfortable. But that's who administers the test at the very end. Okay. Um, as far as you guys, I mean, all of you guys, you know, your tests are paid for. Um, it, it's included in, in your, you know, cost of admission. So um, what we do, though, on the, on the ADX written test, just to let you guys know ahead of time, on the ADX test, when you go to take that test, you – most of you will take that at, at Dixie State University at their testing center. That's, that's one of the places that they administer the ADX test. You have to call them and schedule it, and, and then you go over there and take it. They do charge you $150 to take that test, which you just pay up front. And then when you, have, when, when you pass that test, um, they print you out a certificate. If you just simply – you can text – you can – like send us a picture message or email it to us or whatever, just a picture of that, um, of that certificate of passing the ADX, then we will reimburse you the 150 for taking the test. So you get paid back essentially on taking that one. And then the practical test is, is, uh, so the, the ADX test is 150. You pay it to go take it. Then once you pass it, we reimburse you for it. We usually just do that by Venmo or PayPal, whatever's easiest. But that usually seems to be the easiest. And then um, on the practical test, that's like a, that's a five hundred dollar fee to take that test. But we pay that up front for you. So we actually pay Greg Brooks before you take that test. So there's nothing that you need to worry about as far as taking that one. <clears throat> Um, the only one is just the ADX that you have to pay for, then we reimburse you. Do we go in one at a time with Brooks, or do we all go as a group? How does that work? Um, so the most that he can do is two in one day. So it's usually a four- or five-hour test. You go in, one, you're, you're separated. Sometimes he can do two people at the same time, but you would be in different rooms, if that makes sense. Um, but uh, it's two people per day can take that test. So, and he usually staggers them by two hours at least. So, if, if somebody started at like 10 a.m., then the next person could, would start at noon, and those are the only two he could do that day. That's kind of more of an FA rule that he can only do two per day. So, yeah, you don't okay. you don't all go in at the same time or anything like that. It's all solo. And then we, like I said, we facilitate all the scheduling of that at the very end. Um, any other questions about the tests or graduation requirements, attendance, anything like that? Is that testing center? Is that testing center up on top of the old airport? Um, no, it's actually right over there on 1000 East, just there, um, just up from the main campus. It. Uh, you know, where, I know where it is. I just thought they moved it, but I know um, where it is. They, I don't know. Well, no, up on top of that, isn't that that's Dixie Applied Technology Center up there, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. that oh, is. Yeah. It's in the North Plaza still. 
It's like right across the street from Swig. Oh, okay. Right there on a thousand east. So um, that's where you would go take it, though. Yeah. And we'll talk a lot more about that as we get closer to getting people ready to take that. So, but if there's no other questions, let's take another uh, 10 minute break and uh, get back on here just after 10 30 or just after 8 30. Well, I keep looking at mine. I'm on Eastern time. So, 8 30. Okay. What I wanted to do now was uh, kind of start talking a little bit more about the. Uh, the dispatcher job itself. Um, I posted in back in the Google classroom. Now I posted it in two different spots. You can go and click on the about and you can click on this dispatcher job preview video. Or if you, if you just on the main page on the announcements page, you'll also see the link to it right there. It's a YouTube video. It's seven minutes long. So this was a video that was created by Delta airlines. It, it, it is a little bit specific to Delta Airlines. However, the concepts and what you see in the video is true of a dispatcher's job no matter where you work. Uh, Delta, SkyWest, United, American, Alaska, Southwest, doesn't matter what airline, the, the concept is the same. So other than it saying Delta and having Delta airplanes and stuff like that, um, the rest of it is all – very accurate depiction of a of like a daily idea of, of how a how a day in the life of a dispatcher is um in the video delta delta calls their dispatchers flight superintendent so anytime where it says flight superintendent that really is meaning a a dispatcher so um the best way for you guys to view this is actually to just everyone mute everyone mute themselves, click on the link, and then just watch it on your own devices. If I try to, excuse me, if I, if I try to put it on here, it'll just be really choppy and it won't stream. So anyway, so we'll take another, um, so it's a seven minute video and I'll just say, I'll jump, We'll, we'll kind of reconvene back on here in like eight or nine minutes. Um, give everyone a few, like an extra minute or two to have everyone get through it. But let's just say at uh, at eight, uh, 8.44, um, jump back onto here. But it'll give everybody um, a chance to click on this and watch it. So we'll go ahead and do that now. Okay, did everybody get a chance to watch that? Yes. Yep. Yep. Yes. yes. Cool. What did you guys think? Sounds awesome. Trying to get you excited for for the job a little bit, maybe. Yeah. Good deal. Well, yeah. So they. they I really like that video because it uh, it does it does do a really good job at showing what a what a typical day is like in dispatch and and what you're doing you know and I'm not sure how many of you <clears throat> realized you know 100% what what the job entailed before watching that or you know depending on how much knowledge you've had on it before you know getting interested in this class and what you'd seen before but but it, it, it really is a, a wide variety of different things going on each day. Some some days are really slow, and some days are really high paced. And you know it can it can be stressful on some days, and it can be nice and calm on others. And so one thing that uh, 
that that I you know that I like to some of the terminology they use in there like <clears throat> the one guy talks about how he's like um uh, what, what is it called he's he's like leading an orchestra basically you know or something and and uh that that is kind of really truly what it's like i mean you have a lot of different departments at your disposal and one thing that you heard them talking about in there is the OCC so the OCC stands for the operational control center and and every airline has an OCC, and that's typically where the dispatchers work from. Um, so inside that OCC can be a lot of different departments, including the dispatchers. There's also, um, you know, usually crew support people, um, maintenance people, weather people. Um, you have, you know, a lot of management people in there, um, customer service, um, all sorts of you know different departments that are all really trying to work as one to make the airline function and when things happen and i know that you hear about a lot of different things you know even just in the news even if you don't know anything about dispatch at all you've probably heard of different things going on like where you know like things that make national headlines like last year when delta airlines had like a power power outage at their OCC in Atlanta, and it affected thousands and thousands of flights, and thousands of cancellations um, came from it, and things like that. You hear about that stuff because it makes the news, <clears throat> but that's that kind of stuff is is real stuff going on. And in the OCC, when something like that's going on, it, it's hectic and crazy. Now that's kind of a rare event, but you start working, you know, you, you you'll see things that you've never seen. And, you know, and, and one of the other comments in there from the lady, she says that, you know, it's, it's a calm day. And then suddenly something happens that there's not a playbook for, and it might be the first time that specific thing has ever happened before. And like I said, at the beginning of tonight's class, it's, it's a, it's a job where no two days are the same. You, you see stuff that <clears throat> you think that, uh, you know, the answers for, and, you know, you do base a lot of your decision-making on experience and that will get you through a lot of tougher days in that environment. But, you know, the, I say tough days, I don't, and even though they're stressful days and high paced days, it doesn't necessarily mean they're bad days though. I mean, a lot of people, you know, in this environment, in this job, live for those kind of days because they like it. I mean, they like that type of energy where stuff's going on and they have to make quick decisions, you know, quick, smart decisions. And um, you have to work with a lot of different people to make things function. You know, SkyWest is no different. If, you know, those of you that end up at SkyWest Airlines, you know, right now they're operating 2,500 flights a day. And you can imagine, I mean, that's, that's like a flight taken off every couple minutes, you know, or, or more, you know, several, you know, every couple minutes. And so, uh, you know, it's, you're, you know, even though you may not know a lot about the job itself right now, I mean, you're, you're responsible for those flights and a dispatcher specifically, <clears throat> you know, whereas most people in the world don't even know that job exists. And I'm not sure how many of you knew that it existed, you know, until recently, but um, you always know that there's pilots, but very few people know that, that from an airline flight perspective, it takes two people to make a flight go and two people have authority over any given airline flight. And those two people are the pilot, like being the captain that's in the actual airplane, and the dispatcher. So we, there's a little thing in this world that we, we call operational control. And you can go ahead and mark that down as the very first thing that you're gonna wanna memorize and know about and and talk about, you know, you're going to, we're going to talk a lot about this over the next eight weeks. It's going to be something that's going to be on tests, quizzes, in your practical test, in your 
whenever you interview for a dispatch job, you're going to hear about this and have to talk about it. But you're going to need to know what operational control is. And operational control in the airline, in the flight world, is, and this is what you're going to want to know and what you're going to want to memorize, but it is the authority to initiate, conduct, and terminate a flight. So that's something that you're going to want to write down and memorize. Definition of operational control. The authority to initiate, conduct, and terminate a flight. And it may sound kind of vague uh, right now, just that simple de definition, but you'll learn a lot more about what each of those things means uh, you know, over this course. But one thing that you're also going to want to write down and memorize in conjunction with that is that there's only two people on any given flight, two people that have operational control. And one is the captain, the, the pilot, and the second is the dispatcher. And that operational control is 50-50. The pilot can't do anything without the dispatcher signing off, and the dispatcher can't do anything without the captain signing off. You'll know that there's another pilot in the plane, the first officer, right? He has no operational control. So the dispatcher, there sitting on, in the ground at the OCC, has more authority, more operational control than the guy sitting in the right seat in the airplane. So just to kind of put it in perspective of how important the dispatcher position is, it's, uh, it's, it's very, very important and, and it's crucial. So um, anybody have any questions on that? Anybody have any questions on the dispatcher job? Anything about the video? Um, there's a lot of information in there. Anybody, any questions on that? Just stuff that you've been wanting answered? I I am wondering about the medical because I don't really have any medical training. And they did mention that in the video. So how would you deal with that? Or does that the ATC that takes that? Oh, no, so that's going to be, so anything that comes up. So there, there's a really good um it's, it's important, obviously, early on to establish what, what ATC is and how it relates to a dispatcher. But ATC, the only thing that they're going to help you with is giving you instructions on where to fly. Everything else is going to be handled by the dispatcher. And even the dispatcher, in a lot of cases, is not that you're going to be ever – you know, radioing up to the plane and saying, turn left, turn right. That's obviously the responsibility of air traffic control. But if there is any sort of an emergency, any sort of, whether it be a mechanical emergency, a medical emergency, anything like that, the first point of contact is going to be the dispatcher. Now, the dispatcher is going to decide typically where that aircraft, if it needs to divert immediately for any sort of an emergency, it's usually going to be the dispatcher that makes that decision as to where that plane is going to go. Once the dispatcher decides where it's going to go, then the pilots get in touch with ATC and they tell them where they're going to go. And then ATC simply gives them the instructions on, uh, you know, on, on where to turn and things like that on how to get there. But it's the dispatcher usually making that decision on where they're going to go and what they're going to do. Now, from a medical perspective, to answer your question, yeah, there's going to be a lot of things you don't necessarily know. Um, there's a ton of, like, I, like that video showed, there's a lot of different departments at your disposal, though. And when somebody calls up with a medical emergency, there's a lot of different options. Um, you're going to find that Almost every flight has some sort of a doctor or a nurse on board just by just by chance, really. I mean, you know, they, I, I don't think I've ever had a medical emergency where there wasn't a nurse or a doctor of some sort on board that usually assists. Now, 
they don't always necessarily give the correct information. And, and a lot of times they give information based off of not wanting to have any sort of liability. So um, <clears throat> it's important to remember that. But also at your disposal as a dispatcher is every airline has contact with, with doctors on the ground. And you'll learn this, whether it's SkyWest or wherever you end up working, that when somebody calls in, hey, we've got a medical emergency, we can patch them in with uh, an aeromedical doctor on the ground. Uh, it's usually just we put them on hold. We call. Uh, it's usually a service that's just provided, but we call that service. They get a doctor on the line, and then we patch them in, and then they talk directly to the airplane and with us on the line listening. So that's oh, typically okay. what you'll that's do. Way better. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Now, now, some in some in some cases, you're you're going to see it a lot of different ways. You're going to see like, oh, they may not even request a medical patch. Sometimes they just divert and just want to go to the the nearest suitable airport to get on the ground and get that person an ambulance and you know headed to the hospital. So it really just depends on the situation. But if if there's you know if they're wondering what they should do, sometimes we patch them in with a doctor, and then the doctor. We'll tell them just over the radio, oh, this is what you should do. Make sure, you know, the lay the passenger down, put their feet up, give them some orange juice. You know, you'll you'll be you'll be amazed at how many um, in air medical emergency problems are solved with having the passenger lay down in the galley, put their feet up in the air and give them orange juice. Remember that I told you that here <laughs> because I will. You'll, it'll solve a lot of uh, issues because the, the number one thing you're going to see is that uh, you're going to hear passengers passing out or passengers are lightheaded or dizzy, and that's going to be always what they're going to suggest them to do. Now, sometimes sometimes they just divert and they don't even talk to you or ask you, you know, but most of the time, if, if an emergency is going on, the dispatcher is the first person they're going to talk to and, uh, you know, that's how it should be because you're the guy on the ground with all the information. They have limited access to things up in the cockpit. And honestly, they're dealing with other stuff. They need to fly the plane. They don't, a lot of times they don't got time to be looking up like where, you know, where's the nearest medical facility? Where should I divert? That's kind of, that's going to be the dispatcher's job. Um, Davis, do you want to chime in on any of that subject? Yeah, actually, it is uh, almost incredible how many things are solved by laying them down, giving them sugar, and uh, sometimes just giving them oxygen. Um, but most of the time, I don't think I've ever had one that didn't have a doctor on board either. And uh, if it's a very serious thing, a lot of times they, they don't even talk to you, and they just land at the nearest place, and they they'll just send you, Hey, we're going here and have uh, medical meet us at the gate. Um, it's, I've never actually had to do a phone patch though. Uh, I thought that was going to be a much more frequent thing with how many medical diversions that I've had. Um, but I've, I've never actually had to do a phone patch. There's always been a doctor on board that had some sort of say in the matter. Um, or we could, hold out long enough to land at like a major airport that had uh, like a hospital nearby. Um, but there's, there's all sorts of different things that you have to take into consideration when you get those. And a lot of times, as soon as you get them too, you want to go ahead and contact uh, like at SkyWest. I know a lot of times I'll contact the ship supervisor and see if they also have any opinion in the matter as to where they want us to uh, divert to and that they don't have operational control. Um, but sometimes they have been around for so long that they can also help you out as to making decisions on that. Um, but there's a lot of uh, things at your disposal to help you make decisions and each one is going to end up different than the next. Yeah, so it's uh, it is kind of it is kind of different with the 
uh, each airline's actually uniquely different. Like I've talked to um, friends of mine that have gone to work at like Southwest Airlines as an example. I have a lot of friends that work at Southwest Airlines as dispatchers, and they tell me that they usually have like regarding the medical emergency, like they usually have a couple of them per day and on a weekly basis, they usually will do a medical phone patch like three or four times a week. And then you'll hear of like people like us at sky West that I think I only did a medical patch maybe like three or four times in six years. And then my friends at Southwest are telling me they do it three or four times a week. So what's the difference? I, <laughs> um, I have actually heard that certain, uh, I rode in the cockpit with some guys that work for, I can't remember if it was American or United. Um, I actually just jumped said to Hawaii not too long ago, and I can't remember if it was there on the way that they told me or if it was on the way back that we had a, a passenger on board that passed out, and um, flight attendant called up the cockpit, and they laid him down, uh, gave him juice, uh, oxygen, and we were talking to them, and they, he told me that it's actually policy that they do a medical phone patch if they have to declare emergency and divert for a passenger. So I think in some places it's, they, they have to do it. Yeah. And I, I wish that they would actually make that a policy at SkyWest airlines, because <clears throat> one thing that you're going to find is that, and just like Davis was saying, like there, there's almost always a nurse or a doctor on board the flight. But the problem is, is, now, you can imagine if you are a nurse or a doctor and you are on a flight and something happens and there's a passenger and you get up and you go up and offer your assistance. Well, considering the environment in which you are in, you know, 35,000 feet in the air and you don't know what's going on, the last thing you want to do is be liable for anything that happens to that passenger because of the fact that you're a doctor and you decided to assist and offer your offer help, right? So you're always going to side with caution. And the problem with that, not that that's a problem. I mean, in real life, it's always obviously best to side with caution. But the one thing that you're going to, you'll notice is that <clears throat> that almost always ends up meaning that the flight diverts to an airport for a medical emergency when in reality, it actually didn't need to. So a lot of these airlines, some of the, and it's really more with the major airlines, they make it now a policy that anytime that there's a medical issue, they have to do a medical patch over the air with a doctor, even if there is a doctor or a nurse on board assisting the passenger. Even in that same situation, they still do the medical phone patch because oftentimes the, the person that they do the medical phone patch with is trained with um, – they're trained in in-air emergencies. And it's kind of funny because a few years ago I actually went to a conference, um, and it's, they're called an InfoShare conference. And there was a um, – the University of Pittsburgh – was putting on a kind of a seminar. The, anyway, you'll come to learn that the University of Pittsburgh and their medical school, they are the number one provider of the in-air medical patch service. Almost every airline in the United States subscribes to the University of Pittsburgh medical in-air services. So it's usually somebody at the University of Pittsburgh that you do the medical phone patch with because they handle almost all the airline's medical patches. And they said in this seminar <clears throat> that there's, and I, I know we're kind of getting a little bit off topic, but we've kind of built in some time for this. And anyway, the there's only three reasons that you should ever divert for a medical reason, for, for medical purposes. And that is, and, you know, this isn't anything you got to memorize or write down, but I'm sure this is probably going to stick with most of you guys because you're going to see this so much in the future that your flights are going to divert and they really don't need to. But <clears throat> there's only three reasons. One is childbirth. So if, if somebody is giving birth to a child, that necessitates an immediate diversion, you know, for that purpose. Number two is cardiac arrest. 
that um, and then three and this one seems really um, really I, I guess it doesn't seem like it would happen but uh, the third one even though it's rare is basically any bleeding from and I can't remember exactly if it was like the carotid artery or any any sort of bleeding from from like a, a major, I guess like any any major arter, arterial bleeding is basically what it was. Um, would also necessitate a, a, an immediate diversion. But if it doesn't fit within one of those three categories, then the universe, then this service, that medical patch from the University of Pittsburgh, the doctor will tell you not to divert unless it's one of those three things. So keep that in mind in the future when you're dispatching and you get a phone patch. Because almost always the doctor on board the plane is going to tell them to divert when they don't need to. But if they simply would do the medical patch, the doctor on the ground will tell them not to divert. And that's why these policies now for these major airlines, because it costs, it costs thousands of dollars for a plane to divert. And in some cases, hundreds of thousands of dollars, depending on the size of the plane, to divert for, you know, and obviously if it's in the intent of saving a life, then, you know, cost doesn't matter. But when you're doing it, when you don't need to, then it saves a lot of money. And in order to cut down on a lot of these diversions, even if there's a doctor or nurse on board, they make them do the medical patch. And that's because they don't want them diverting when they don't need to. And so that's kind of my whole thing about why I kind of wish SkyWest would adopt the same policy. But uh, anyway... So kind of just an interesting information. But uh, the other thing there kind of mentioned was uh, um, the jump seating. And I don't know if that's anything that uh, you guys have known about yet. Um, but as a dispatcher, you also get access to the cockpit jump seat. And on a yearly basis, you are required to go sit in the cockpit on, a, on real life flights, sit there in the cockpit and observe operations from the cockpit jump seat as the plane flies around you it's required to do before you actually dispatch so once you get hired on with an airline go through all their training and and pass their comp check the next thing you do is they make you go out and do your jump seat rides and you got to do five hours a year and go out there and do that but because you have to do that on a yearly basis the, the dispatchers have access to the cockpit jump seat even for leisure purposes when when needed. Um, um, if you are wanting to just get up and go somewhere uh, as a dispatcher, you can walk out to the airport or drive or walk, I guess, but you can go out to the airport, walk in, and it doesn't matter what airline, what airplane, whatever, you can walk up to the ticket counter and say, I want a list for the jump seat on this flight, and as long as it's open and available, they will put you in the jump seat and you can ride around basically for free. Um, I mean, this is in addition to your regular flight benefits. So it's kind of cool, some of that stuff. Um, but you'll learn a lot more about that as well as we go on. But any other questions on anything that anybody have? Nothing. Well, I guess guess we've just done a good job at presenting the material then tonight, huh? So, um, okay, well, I didn't really plan much more than this. We only have about 20 minutes left anyway. So um, unless you guys have any questions or anything like that, I was just going to go ahead and cut you guys loose for the night. And um, um, last chance for any questions, though. Sure that nobody wants to ask anything. Um, if not, then uh, we'll just plan on same time, same place tomorrow night, 5.30. And I'll be on as um, – I might not be on right at the beginning, but Garrett is going to be the instructor. And uh, I'll join on at some point during the class as well. And um, – but yeah, we're excited to have, get the class going with you guys and hope you guys learn a lot and um, feel free. You know, we're always at your disposal to ask any questions. Uh, yeah. Um, tomorrow when we start the class um, or when we do the classes, is there like uh, 
list of stuff that we need, like the test that we have to study and stuff like that during the course, or will it be like a where you send us like in the classroom, like the classroom app, whatever you send us, like stuff we have to study, like certain things or anything like that. Yeah, but most I mean, of the, we got to do, you know what I mean? Yeah, most of it though, like there's there's not going to be anything before class that you would need. You just show up for the class, log on, and then as things come up during the class, then they'll be posted during the class. Okay. If it's something you need, so. But yeah, other than that, okay, you just... need between now and then to do, and so just simply show up tomorrow, log in, um, but you don't need anything ahead of time. Okay, I was curious. Cool. Any other questions? No, I'm good. I think I'm good. Okay. Well, thanks, guys. Thank and yeah, somebody have a question? No, just said thank you. Okay, cool. So, uh, cool. Well, we'll call it a night then. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll talk to you guys all tomorrow. Okay, sounds good. Cool. Thank See you. you later. See ya. Bye. Thanks. Bye.